coming up on this episode of The Social Hour. You might know him as one half of Pomplemousse, but Jack Conti is also the CEO and co-founder of Patreon. And he's going to tell Amber and I a lot more about the company, how it started, and where it's going. All that and more next. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for the social hour is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is the social hour with Sarah Lane and Amber MacArthur, episode 162, recorded Monday, May 12th, 2014. This episode of the social hour is brought to you by 99designs, the world's largest graphic design marketplace. 99designs connects businesses seeking quality, affordable designs with a community of more than 295,000 graphic designers. Visit 99designs.com slash social hour to receive a free power pack upgrade valued at $99. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of The Social Hour. We are on episode 162. I'm Sarah Lane from Twit World Headquarters in Petaluma, California. I'm Amber McArthur, and I'm in Toronto, Ontario, Canada, after, oh, I guess I was here last week, but uh, I had just gotten back from St. John's, Newfoundland, which was a great little trip, and we have great weather in Toronto, Sarah, so I'm very happy about that, but I hear that things are really heating up where you are. True story, yes. Gosh, I haven't been outside since... Well before noon, but uh, it's nice and cool in our studio. But uh, yeah, the Bay Area is going to have a heat wave this week. So, you know, I'm just going to be brave, Amber, and and face the days of heat without air conditioning. It's going to be fine, though. It's nice. It'll be toasty, right? Yeah, yeah it'll be fun. Okay, let's, sure. get, let's get some heat up in here. We'll all wear sundresses. It'll be great. <laughs> well, we've got a great guest um, coming up a little bit later in the show. Jack Conti, who's the co-founder of Patreon, is going to join us. And really excited about that because not only do Amber and I know people who use it, uh, but it's a really great service for artists of all different kinds of disciplines. Uh, so we'll be talking with him in a few minutes. But I guess we should start off with our news of the week. Uh, I don't know if this is the most interesting to all of you. It's probably not the not exactly what you'd like from Pinterest, but Pinterest has officially launched a paid ad test um, with not that many brands, a lot of big brands that you've heard of before. Walt Disney Parks, for example, Nestle, you know, big brands like that um, in the form of what they're calling promoted pins. Um, those only show up in certain sections of Pinterest. So if you're a Pinterest user, um, I, I, they believe they show up on a uh, search, uh, search results page and one of the other curated pages. But, you know, Amber, I think this was inevitable. Pinterest is used by, you know, many millions of people and they have to figure out how to monetize it. Yeah, and I, I don't think it's too intrusive. I mean, when you read the article on TechCrunch and you see how they've laid it out, the reality is when you do a search, you know, you may see promoted pins and uh, I don't think it's something that kind of jumps out at you and is irritating or annoying in any way. It's not necessarily taking any of your information and abusing it, which of course uh, we have seen with other social networks. So at the end of the day, I think this is one of the least intrusive uh, advertising uh, integrations that I've seen in the social media world. So I don't think they'll upset too many people. And based on what the article says, I mean, there's pressure on Pinterest to be able to generate revenue. They were valued at $3.8 billion just a few months ago, and they've got to figure out a way to monetize the site, or as we know, it won't be around at all. Exactly. Yeah, it, it was It was, It was. was a matter of time. Uh, we knew it was happening. I believe the company said last fall, this is something that we're going to test eventually when we can figure out how to make it look as unintrusive as possible. And Amber, I think you're right. I think it's it's, it's not really diminishing the experience, at least from what I've seen so far. And yes, this is very new. And yes, this is a limited test. So sure, in time, this could be more of an issue of not wanting to see too many ads. But uh, for, for a service like Pinterest, which is not a public company yet, and, and they, you know, they need to have a, a guaranteed source of revenue, it makes sense. It does make sense. And I would also even argue that with Pinterest, because people are posting products there, you know, they're posting actual phys physical things. It just felt like the writing has been on the wall for a long time. It's not like on Twitter, for example, where maybe you're sharing your ideas or, or post things that you're thinking. It's really about products and about things that exist in the commercial world. So I think, again, just kind of a next phase for them. Well, speaking of next phases, uh, this is actually kind of a an interesting article uh, got published on BuzzFeed, I think it was this morning, maybe it was last night, about 
tweet storms. Now, tweet storms is just a term for if I were to tweet out something that was several paragraphs long, well, that's not going to fit into one tweet. So I might send these in a variety of tweets in rapid succession. Mark Andreessen of Andreessen Horowitz uh, VC firm, obviously founder of Netscape as well, he's sort of getting famous on Twitter for joining Twitter, or coming back to Twitter actually not that long ago, I think in the last six months or so. He does this thing where he numbers his tweets so that you understand that, well, we're only on number three of a thought that might go on for a while and you can jump back and, and see what order that they go in. But it, it's it's definitely been, you know, called you know a, a way to not game Twitter because there's absolutely nothing wrong with what you're doing, but really, it's it's. Uh, I think somebody said uh, uh, this morning in response, it's like the vanity plate of tweeting. You know, you just like it's like you want everybody to look at you, uh, but it diminishes the experience for other people. Vanity plates don't really do that, but you know what I mean. I don't know. I I chuckled a little bit at this, Amber, because. Of course, it's always easy to say, well, you could just unfollow somebody who's annoying or mute them. We can get to that in a minute. But the idea that people just shouldn't use Twitter in a way that's deliberately going to flood someone's stream or be annoying, what do you think? Or do you think that there aren't really rules like that? You know, I, I, this always bothers me when people lash out and get so upset about something where I think, you know, this is just a minor problem in their lives, right? At the end of the day, like you said, you can unfollow someone. And I really don't think that we're here to establish rules for social networks like Twitter. I mean, the beauty of it is that anyone can go on and tweet as much as they want and we can unfollow them. So I, I didn't really feel as though this was really crossing the line. I don't think it's something I would necessarily do. And it reminds me a lot of an article that I read, I think yesterday from a Seattle blog online about Guy Kawasaki and his stance on issues like this. And he's been on the social hour before. And his whole stance is always that you should actually tweet more than you think you should be tweeting. And and he always says, you know, sure, people will unfollow him and now probably mute him. But at the end of the day, he'll gain nine new followers for every person he loses. So it's one of those situations where I think it's kind of a personal choice. But I don't think any of us really have ownership in terms of deciding you know, how someone should use Twitter. I I think you're right. I you know if if, if Twitter the company were to somehow um, uh, I don't know have some sort of a timing cap on the number of tweets that you can send in a short period of time, maybe there actually is one, you know, just for spam purposes. But 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 yeah, it's like you can't tweet more than three times in a five minutes. I don't know. I don't know what that would be. At least that would be the company saying, let's gently remind everybody how this is supposed to be used. But that's really never been the point of Twitter. And the public in the past has made up things like retweeting and mm -hmm. hashtags. And these are, these are organic uh, um, trends that in ways the company has then decided, oh, okay, we're going to make this part of our, you know, you know your, our syntax. So I kind of do have a problem the same way you do about some users saying, you tweet too much, therefore you must be stopped. Because you do have options. You don't have to bear the brunt of somebody tweeting too much if that's, if that's what you don't like. Yeah, and uh, as we're going to get to when we talk about uh, muting people on Twitter, there are even more options now. So I, I think at the end of the day, it really is a situation where uh, I think there are other things in the world we can get more upset about. <laughs> and this is not one of them that deserves perhaps the attention it's been getting. True. Uh, speaking of muting, uh, we should talk about the fact that muting Twitter users on official Twitter apps, uh, which includes Twitter.com and its native apps um, for iOS and, and and Google and Windows phone. Yes, of course. Of course, it's a Twitter app. Uh, now, uh, users, uh, they're rolling out the functionality to be able to mute each other. Now, it's funny. I, I tweeted out of course, tweeted out. Uh, a lot of people were talking on Twitter about this because it's something that affects people that are using Twitter. And I got a lot of responses um, from people who's just, you know, it was, it was always the same response of, well, why would you want to mute somebody if you could just unfollow them? And really, it can be kind of complicated. If I have maybe a colleague that, uh, or, or somebody that I've met before, or for whatever reason, you know, somebody that you like very much, and for whatever reason, they're the way that they're tweeting is maybe there's too much, maybe they're tweet stormy, or maybe, uh, I don't know, if for whatever reason you just feel like it, it, it doesn't either belong in your timeline or it's too much for you, you can mute them. They don't know they're muted, you haven't unfollowed them, and you can uh, unmute them without them ever knowing as well, or them getting some sort of a notification that you've refollowed them. So 
it really is, at least for me, a passive aggressive tool, but it's one that has helped me avoid some potentially uncomfortable conversations with people. I, I just have to laugh because you just said tweet storming. So I think that's a <laughs> quite a cute little words there. <laughs> well, yeah. It's like, it's <laughs> I, yeah, I guess that's a thing now. <laughs> it is a thing. No, I, I think you're right. I, I can't really see necessarily muting anyone. I think uh, it's a situation where, uh, like you said, you can un unfollow them if you want. And there are times, I mean, I just did this Twitter chat this past week and I, I actually felt pretty badly because I had tweeted out like 50 times in an hour answering people's questions. It was a small business Twitter chat. And I thought, I don't know how to get around this, but you know, I wanted to host this Twitter chat and I was interested in the conversation, but it was just for an hour. So I think for the most part, you see people going and tweet storming and it tends to be for a very short amount of time. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the good news. If someone does it kind of all day long and for hours on end, I think commuting is a great option, but unfollowing them is probably even better. Yeah, and and I think that this is a little bit of, it, Twitter sort of has a dilemma here because you've got the people like you and me who, who say there's a time for, the, this is a, just a nice tool to have. You don't have to take advantage of it, but if you want to, you know, even before a really big sporting event, you know you're not gonna be able to watch the game until you're back home eight hours later and you're just like, I gotta mute, you know, a, a, somebody who I know is gonna spoil it for me, who's gonna be live, live tweeting or a particular hashtag, that kind of thing. At the same time, there are definitely, and I noticed this with all the responses that I got just to my initial tweet talking about muting this morning of people saying, but I don't get it. Why wouldn't you just unfollow somebody? There's still a cultural uh, issue where Twitter has a lot of users who are perfectly capable of understanding how things work, but Twitter doesn't make a lot of sense to them. I think that it is a convoluted product and Twitter has the issue of retaining users, I think, primarily for this very reason, is that you or I use it enough so that we're like, yeah, okay, I understand sort of the weirdness of Twitter here and there. But you have a lot of people who are like, I just don't understand why this tool is different than this other tool that I kind of barely understand uh, as it is anyway. And that's a real problem for the company to grow and move forward. Yeah, I definitely think it's a real problem. And there's always that issue, like you, I think you talked about it before on uh, Tech News Tonight, that if you do unfollow someone, people get upset. They, you know, it's a more negative experience in some ways. You know, I think about a guest we had on a couple of weeks ago who said that uh, he would not unfollow me unless I irritated him more or less. And uh, I think about that not every day, but fairly frequently. And <laughs> I, I don't even want to check if he's unfollowed me because I fear the worst, Sarah. Yeah, well, maybe that was him calling just now. <laughs> So I still haven't unfollowed you, I promise. <laughs> I know, I know. Another thing though, Sarah, I don't know if you go through this, but I find as though I consume and get so much content from Twitter on a regular basis. Just this weekend I was sitting down and I, I had a couple magazines and I was sitting diving into articles. And of course I like to read books on a fairly regular basis. But I also find Twitter has really ruined my attention span. You know, I want information really quickly and I want to kind of get in there and consume it. And, and I, I think it's in, like an addictive quality to it, right? And when you get out and you get into the long form, world and you start reading more, you realize how much more you retain and how Twitter is almost a little surface -y, if I can use that word. Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's it's a jumping off point for me for, for a ton of stuff, yeah. which is kind of fun because I'm following enough people that are prolific and sharing things that in general I'm pretty interested in that, yeah, there's a conversation happening on Twitter, but you're right. It is... It's like being in a chat room almost. The really good stuff are the articles that people I trust and, and, and look up to are linking to, and that's where I get a lot of my information, and that's you know, you know the same thing as, as the stuff that the rest of us are passing along, so it kind of works in that way. I think muting is the right call, especially since in a third-party app like Tweetbot, which I use, muting has been around for as long as I can remember, as long as I can remember using it, really, and you don't want to mute too many people because then you figure, okay, well, maybe I should just unfollow some of these people. But I mean, you know, I've got a mute list in there. It's really helpful. And uh, it doesn't do Twitter any favors to not uh, bake in that kind of functionality to their own apps that would keep people like me using third-party apps. I'm still not ready to move out of Tweetbot because I have loyalty toward it. But I would say that mute functionality was something that even if Twitter, Twitter's own native apps were great in every other way, I still mm -hmm. wouldn't use it because of that reason. 
Yeah, no, I could definitely see that. Another thing, uh, just uh, not to get too off track here, and I know we're going to have a tip later, but it made me think when you were mentioning how you like reading shared links that people post on Twitter. And uh, I think about how I, I used to use Chrome all the time, but now I'm using Safari more, especially uh, after upgrading uh, to the latest operating system on my Mac. And I do love the little feature in Safari, the shared link feature within uh, the browser that allows you to see just the links that people have shared on Twitter. I don't know if TweetBot has anything like that, but it's a really interesting way to browse and get to kind of more in-depth content more quickly. No, Twitter does not, does not have that. That's pretty cool, though. It's I cool, think, so you I, get... I think Twitter itself has that functionality in the, under its Discover tab. Or maybe that's to only see images and media that people have posted, not links. Yeah, this is just so literally when I go into Safari and I click, there's the bookmarks and uh, reading list and the shared links. When I click on shared links, I just see the links that people are sharing. And then all of a sudden, I can really uh, throw away all of the posts that are like, hey, having a great time having lunch and stuff that really doesn't have any content in it. And I find just the quality of my Twitter stream, if I just go here, increases very quickly because people are actually sharing great content that is more in depth. Well, speaking of sharing content and Twitter and what to do and what not to do, we did get a voicemail, um, which is a bit of an argument uh, in favor of Twitter lists. <laughs> Hello, Amber and Sarah. Love the show. I just got through listening to episode 158. Um, in regards to what the guest said, yeah, I use, I do the same thing. I limit my Twitter followers. Right now, I'm only following 37 people. And I keep it short so that I can just track what's going on with those, and they're from a variety of categories. But in regard to what the caller said, I believe it was Amy, I use lists tremendously. I have lots of people in lots of different lists, and then I have Flipboard set up so that I can just flip through each list and watch That's what good. this group of people are doing, my tech people that I follow, uh, New sites that I follow, got it all categorized out. Love keeping my followers short and lots of people in the list. Thank y'all. Love how y'all keep me up to date with what's going on. Well, thank you for the phone call. See, it sounded like he was running. Yeah. Or exercising or maybe just, I don't know. Excited. Maybe just excited. Yeah. yeah it's windy out there. We, um, no, thank you for the call. And I think that that's, it's... Every once in a while when someone's like, but who cares about following and muting? Just put people into lists. Follow a very select few of pe people. Maybe the kind of people you really might hang out with on a Friday night type of a thing. And do it that way. And that's fine too. Um, it's a much better way to categorize uh, the people that you want to uh, keep in touch with or at least just hear updates from. It's nothing that I've ever really... I've never used Twitter lists to their full capacity. If you look mm -hmm. at my list, it's like you can tell that I tried to start setting them up like years ago and then I've never been back. But um, but it's, un it's kind of unfortunate that, that lists are so underused. Yeah, I know. Every single episode when we talk about this, Sarah, I always say that I'm going to go in and organize my lists and I never do because I do think it's a great way to be able to use Twitter. But uh, at the end of the day, I still follow thousands of people and I dive in and I dive out. And what I miss, I miss. Uh, and then we could go back to Guy Kawasaki's point that uh, that's why you should post more than once because some people may miss your content. And uh, that would kind of be me. But I think he makes a really good point that list is a great way to deal with this and just follow a few really select people. I feel like I'm too far gone in this respect, and <laughs> I don't know if there's any pulling back. Yeah, me either. Well, because also, I, I follow, gosh, okay, let, let's pull it up and find out what my number is. I follow just over 600 people. I remember when it was 200, and I remember thinking, this is perfect. Anything more than this would yeah. just be too much. And gradually, I've just, I don't know, I've, I've, I just keep accumulating, and I know that you follow more people than that, and so it's like, to put people into lists, I guess you don't technically have to unfollow them, but it makes more sense the way our caller was describing. It's almost like you just unfollow everybody and then you slowly build back people into categories that are maybe almost a little bit closer to Facebook groups type thing where you have certain ideas and, and or you are related to them in a certain way. But it's, just, it's, it's like an organization thing that doesn't sound very fun. 
Yeah, exactly. I'm with you. It doesn't sound like uh, it sounds like something you need to start from the very beginning. And if people are sick of our Twitter chat, uh, I will say that uh, we have uh, another topic that may be of interest, which is all about uh, Google and Google Plus Hangouts and, and having chats in Hangouts. So if you're an Android user, we have a really great tip for you. And this is a really simple thing, although I have to tell you that uh, uh, I haven't tried it out yet, but I did read about it on uh, lifehacker.com. If you're having a group chat in Hangouts and you want a way to specifically reply to just one person in the chat, it's a simple, simple little thing, but all you have to do is just press and hold on a user's avatar. They call it the long press. So press on a user's avatar and you will get their at name and you can instantly reply to them. So it doesn't seem like, you know, you're not mass chatting with everybody, but you can specifically have that conversation with, with just that individual. So I know this happens with me with group chats all the time is it's hard to tell who you're talking to, but this is a really simple way if you're an Android user to get around that. So you can be in a, I don't know, a big group discussion about something and then quickly be like, Hey, Dan, just real quick, are you going to be available to do this before we go back to the group type of a thing? Yes, you would basically, because you, instead of having that group chat and everybody getting your message, if you right. wanted to reply to just one person, you press on their avatar and it, then you can It's like the direct, direct message of Google Hangouts. It is, it is, but I like the, I think the pressing feature and the fact that you don't have to, I mean, obviously you could just click and probably do it, but just pressing on their avatar makes it an easy way to identify that you want to have a conversation directed at that individual. So I think they're solving a really tiny little problem here, but for Android users who use Hangouts, it could be a useful tool. Well, and Hangouts is, I mean, it's, it's Android's answer to, you know, texting, really. I mean, it's, that's, that's what, um, uh, SMS is different, but it's, you know, it's the same thing as iOS messages, hangouts yeah, exactly. are, you know, used by a lot of people. So all this little, you know, they're little, like handy little tricks. It's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Handy little simple things. So that's all good. All I've, good, so. I've got an interesting spotlight for you, Amber, and I'd love to say that I know how this experiment ends, but it hasn't even started yet. But I'm going to tell you about it anyway. It's called 20 Day Stranger, like two zero day stranger. Dot com. It is a experiment built by folks at the MIT Media Lab. And the idea is that I, as somebody who will willfully participated in a uh, experiment to exchange media with a stranger, what we might be able to learn from each other. So if I am accepted into the test, which I hope I am, I Very will cool. be basically matched up with an anonymous person that I do not know who will, who will never get my name or my information and I won't get theirs. But the idea is that we're sharing, uh, you know, location, videos, photos, information with each other. And it's kind of like a, it's a little bit of, you know, a human humanity project type of a thing. And so I'm excited about it. I think it's kind of neat. I mean, it's like you think of, well, what are the types of um, apps and services that that uh, will match you up with someone anonymous? Well, there was uh, what's it? What's the one called that ended up being a bunch of uh, inappropriate photos? Chat, chat roulette. Chat roulette. <laughs> so this is like this is like the opposite of chat roulette. You know, it's supposed to be something that 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 helps us learn from each other. But I really like the idea of, and hopefully, um, anybody who's participating in this. Um, really actually wants to participate in a meaningful way. So um, I don't know, Amber, what do you think? Do you have time for something like this or do you think that this is just a recipe for disaster? I think it's really cool, I have to say. And uh, I think it, like, it's brought to, by, to you by MIT and is it uh, the Dalai Lama Foundation? Is that right? Yes, yeah, Dalai uh, Lama Center for Ethics. Okay, so I think it sounds interesting. It reminds me a little bit, there is a newscaster in the US and he used to do this segment where he literally opened up a phone book and then he kind of closed his eyes and pointed and landed on someone's name and then he actually went to their house to visit them because everybody has a story. It, it reminds me a little bit of that, but more in a, a digital context. So as soon as I watched the video, Sarah, when I saw this in the rundown, I thought it was awesome. It just feels, you know, it feels like a, a PG version of chat roulette, if we can call it that. Exactly, and you know, it's there. there's, there are certain ways that you're going to be able to share information with somebody. Uh, apparently, the, the app is going to pull from Foursquare's API, Google Street View, Instagram. So it's, there's still going to be a sort of a regimented way that mm. you're sharing with the stranger. And I assume if there's anything that ends up being unsavory or 
just not that fun, you know, you're not like going to be held to the fire to complete your 20 days, but I think it's kind of fun. I think it's I think it's a good idea. I think I'm going to find my new best friend out there somewhere. <laughs> and we're going to say we met through 20 Day Stranger. Thank you, MIT Media Labs. It's kind of fun. It's like the the future of the pen pal almost, right? Exactly. Yes. I that's like right. It. It's, it's very a, cool. It's a blind, not even a date, a blind, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what it is. We don't have a word for that yet. Well, quick uh, reminder, Amber and I are recording this at a kind of a funny time. Uh, we record, we're pre-recording um, because I'm going to be out during our regular time. But our regular time for the live recording, for anybody who wants to join us when we shoot this show uh, live and dirty, is uh, Thursday at 12 noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern time. And if you ever want to go back and rewatch one of our interviews, uh, or maybe you just are a little bit behind, I, our caller today said that he had just finished episode 158, which means he's, I don't know, four episodes back. That's cool. We love the fact that you are able to watch and listen to us on demand at your leisure. Twit.tv slash TSH is our website. That's where all of our subscribe links are. You can subscribe to the show with audio or video feeds, and then you don't even have to think about when there's a new episode or when we're recording because it just gets delivered to you automatically. And all of our show notes are there, too. Every episode we have has a variety of links and, uh, and, and, and stories that we've covered. Andy Bayo of Wax Pancake was our guest last week. He had a really interesting story about bringing uh, back upcoming.org. Yeah, if you missed that, it's, I mean, it's its very inspiring, truly. I, and yeah, I know that word is overused, but I, I think that's exactly what, what he is um, and what he does. So yeah, thanks to everybody who watches and listens to us each week. Should we take a little break before we bring on our guest? Yeah, let's think, do it. I think we should. Uh, today we're thanking 99designs for sponsoring this episode of The Social Hour. This is kind of fun. Uh, 99designs can help you with a beautiful design that is part of your online presence, your online identity, your brand identity. You, you know, whether you're a team or an individual or, or, or anything in between, the way that you come across online is a huge deal. So, all right. What does your logo look like, say? Maybe you don't even have one. Maybe you're like, I'd love a logo. My LLC needs some sort of brand. I don't know how to make a design. I don't want to overpay a designer. That's where 99designs can really come in handy because you give 99designs your idea, and then you get uh, ideas from a variety of designers in the community, and then you can choose which one you go through. Every business, no matter how big or small you are, you need, you need a professional logo. Your business may have grown, but maybe your logo kind of looks small beans. That happens too. Maybe it's time you graduate to something that looks a little bit slicker. Maybe your cousin made your first logo and you're like, well, my cousin doesn't really know what they're doing. So <laughs> it's time to actually have a designer. Uh, maybe new technologies um, have rendered your logo kind of not compatible. Maybe it doesn't look that good on Facebook anymore. It was, it was, it was, it just needs, it needs a polish. Maybe your logo was a DIY project. Maybe you just don't like it. It's just time to get a nice new design. You want to look at your logo. You want to be proud of it. And you want it to represent the business uh, that you are running or the person that you are. It's time. So head on over to 99designs and get a design that you love. Guaranteed. It's fun. It's fast. It's very affordable. And you get the design that you want. If you want to start your logo today, you have dozens of designers to choose from. They're ready to work for you. Get those designs within seven days. Visit 99designs.com slash social hour. That's 99designs.com slash social hour. And get a $99 power pack of services completely free. A power pack is uh, more designer time and attention. It's kind of like, it's like, you know, being in the priority line at the airport. And they'll bold and they'll highlight and feature your design project in their marketplace. And that's great for you because then you get almost twice as many designs. So you have a dozen designs. Well, how about, you know, 20 of them? You're going like, to like what you have to choose from. Uh, 99designs.com slash social hour. Take advantage of that power pack. It's free. And we thank 99designs for sponsoring our show. All right. Are we with Jack? Yes, I'm right here. Hello. All right. Hey, Jack. Um, 
Uh, thanks for joining us a little bit later in the show. Amber, I know uh, you were trying really hard because we were, um, we've been interested in the business model of Patreon. And I guess, I don't know, Jack, do you want to just, for anybody who's unfamiliar with, with, with the essence of what Patreon does for artists, give us uh, the short version. Yeah, so um, Patreon is uh, ongoing crowdfunding for creators. Uh, so imagine like a Kickstarter campaign, except instead of one big pledge for one big project, it's recurring pledges um, for little things. So for instance, uh, I make videos and I put them on YouTube. And um, every time I release a video, my fans have pledged, you know, a dollar or two dollars. So um, basically their cards get charged upon the release of a new video. That's the basic idea. And it works for web comics, it works for bloggers, authors, um, comedians, anybody releasing digital content on a regular basis. I have to say, too, uh, I know we want to talk a lot about the service, but uh, one of the things that really intrigued me is I think maybe I saw Alexis O'Hanion or someone had posted a link to the promo video that you created with your team where you all do a rap song together <laughs> talking about your individual roles at the company. I think we have a, a link in the rundown. But it was literally one of the, the most creative things I've ever seen come out of a company, and it really inspired me to go check out the website as well. Can you talk a little bit about um, that and your experience also in the, in the music industry? and as an artist. Yeah, sure. So I myself am a creator. Um, I'm actually not taking a salary as the CEO of Patreon and making my living using the product itself um, with my personal following and also the following of um, my band, Pomplamoose. But um, I've been a professional YouTube creator since 2007. And my job, it, okay, this is our rap video now that you're seeing. Um, so I've been making videos for, you know, eight years now um, and, and putting them on YouTube. So we thought, what better way to promote our company, you know, and tell people about what we do than to make a funny music rap video um, <laughs> and, and let people kind of, you know, meet the team. Because the other thing that we want to do is, you know, we want it to be a personal thing. We want to be able um, to to talk to creators as other creators ourselves. And so, you know, part of, part of what we're trying to do at Patreon is create and, and let people know that we're in it too, um, which again is, is I think so important to the business. If we're gonna, if we're gonna be a creator-friendly business and and uh, and hold creators on a pedestal, I think we have to put our money where our mouth is. You know, so, uh, yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, uh, I was just gonna say, uh, Amber and I have a former colleagues uh, who have who have um, taken to Patreon and are are doing really well, a lot of success. Uh, people that we used to work with at Twit, and that is really heartening to see uh, that there is clearly a way that people can provide you know, just a little bit of money towards something that they, they really want to become a reality. Uh, Tom Merritt, of course, um, former co-host on Tech News Today, is using Patreon um, and doing really well. And, and I know people are, are, are happy to see him uh, take things uh, forward. Why do you think something like Patreon was necessary when you obviously are gonna get compared to Kickstarter or Indiegogo? What makes Patreon work so well for artists specifically? Yeah, so, I mean, we realized a little while ago, you know, we're not a crowdfunding company. Um, we're a media company and we're using crowdfunding as a mechanism to finance the site. And I think that's most that's most of the difference between us and, you know, a crowdfunding platform like Kickstarter. I happen to think Kickstarter is amazing. It's one of the greatest companies ever. Um, and I love what they do. It's just as a creator who's uploading stuff onto YouTube, I just need different tools, right? I, I don't mm -hmm. want to make an album. I don't want to film a movie I don't, or write a script or invent some project um, to kind of monetize. That's I want to just keep making videos and I don't need a budget of $100,000 to do that. I just need a salary for myself as a creator. Um, and so Patreon is a way that you can connect with your fan base on a regular ongoing basis, right? It's not transactional. It's not one project and then you're out. For people who are releasing digital media regularly, whether it's Saturday Morning Breakfast Serial or Tom Merritt, you know, or, um, or Pomple Moose or, or Peter Holland's Smooth Groove, anyone who's releasing things on a regular basis, for them to be able to get paid for doing exactly what they do, right? That's that's all they're doing. They're not changing their workflow at all. And that's, that's like our value proposition to creators is, hey, you know that thing that you do where you release stuff all the time and people love it? Keep doing that, except get paid for it, 
right? That's what we're saying. Like, just keep doing exactly what you're doing. That's where you have value to the world as a creator. That's why people love you and follow you and read your tweets and read about your creative process. It's because they love what you make on a regular basis. And, and that's what we want Patreon to, to foster is we want to enable people to keep doing what they do, to keep building things and putting them into the world for free. Um, and a lot of their fans want to pay for it. Um, not, and again, it's not a paywall. It's not pay-per-view or you, you can't see this unless you pay. It's, hey guys, I'm making stuff. I'm putting it out for free. If you'd like to pay me to help me do that, then you can. Um, that's the ethos of Patreon. And that's just a very different thing than doing an Indiegogo campaign, you know, where, okay, I've got this thing and I'm not going to be able to do it unless I raise $150,000 and I need this and here's my budget. And then I'm going to become a fulfillment company. I'm going to send you t-shirts and I'm going to send you the power pack with this merchandise and that thing. And, you know, a lot of creators get lost in becoming a merchandising and fulfillment company when they do larger campaigns like that. And, and again, Patreon is a way for them to just keep doing exactly what they're doing, right? Just, just keep releasing things in the world. That's what people love you for. That's why, that's why people are watching what you make. Can you give us a, a reason why someone would want to come to Patreon and use it as a platform versus just say, put up a, a little PayPal link on their website and say, donate to me? I mean, what advantages are there of using Patreon? Yeah, so the, the biggest advantage is, is uh, accepting monthly pledges, right? So um, you can have a PayPal widget and accept tips. Um, it just, it just doesn't work that well. Not that PayPal doesn't work that well. It's just PayPal doesn't have a funding campaign and, and tools around building a following. So Patreon has um, basically what we're doing fundraising right now. So I'm forgive me if I'm speaking in fundraising terms. <laughs> That's okay. Um, but, uh, um, you know, it has CRM, which is a customer relations management software, basically. And, and you know, what that basically is, I, I just learned these terms a couple months ago, so I'm still getting used to them. But basically what it is, it's, it's our patron manager, right? It's a place where um, creators can see who's pledging to them on a recurring basis, and then they can interact with those people. It's it's relationship management. So they can message just their $10 patrons or just their just their $100 patrons, right? They have an activity feed where patrons can post um, you know, fan art and then a creator can interact. They can there's a digital good delivery system. So a creator can send an MP3 to only the creators who are uh, sorry, to only the patrons who are pledging over $10, you know, per piece of content. Things like that. There's a whole lot of social and engagement tools that allow creators to reward their patrons who are giving them, you know, giving them money on an ongoing basis. Um, and we make it, we make it very easy and very plain. So, um, so those kinds of tools are, are a big advantage to just having a, a donate button. Um, the recurring pledge structure is a, is a huge advantage. Um, and then there's also, uh, there's also the fact that just recently we launched what we're calling the creation page. Um, which is basically a venue for each piece of content that you create. And I hate the word content. Actually, I'm not going to say the word content anymore. I'm trying to phase that <laughs> out of my it vocabulary. Off your list. Yeah, for each piece of art that you create, um, we, we give you a we give you a page that we auto generate a page. Um, so, and on that page, you can watch the piece of art, you can read the piece of art, whatever it is. And there's a little become a patron button next to it. So, and then on that page, also there's comments and there's the reward tiers. And um, so, basically we're giving people a way to share not only their digital media, but to, but to get new patrons and to monetize that free media at the same time. Um, and usually you kind of have the choice of building your audience or making money. And the creation page is a way to combine those two things. You share your work and get new patrons all on the same page. Speaking um, of building audiences, I, I, I think about uh, some of the Patreon projects that seem to be doing really well. Like, wow, gosh, you could do that full time. That's awesome. But that's not going to necessarily be, a, you don't just have a great idea and then figure out how to get donations and all of a sudden you're rich. It's kind of that same issue that people say, well, why am I not more popular on Twitter? Why don't I have more YouTube views? Is Patreon, what are they doing to kind of promote outreach for the projects that it believes in? Yeah, so, okay. This is something we've talked about extensively at Patreon, and I, I have very uh, strong viewpoints on this. There is no, there is no company. I don't care what the company does. There's no company that's going to make you a star. Um, companies are going to give you 
software that will help you publish your work, reach people, make money. Um, but that's the best they can do. Even even YouTube, right? I mean, people talk about YouTube stars, but it's the people that that are so incredible, right? It's the creators who spend so much time right. and they're creative and they have incredible ideas and they're visionaries. Um, so, so Patreon is no different. Um, we can't we can't guarantee that you'll be making money on Patreon. If you have an audience, if you have a community around your work and people like what you make and you put up a Patreon page, then you're very likely to be making money on Patreon. Um, if you're just getting started and you don't have an audience yet, um, I still think it's a good idea to start a Patreon page right now and, and advertise it as you grow, you know, and as, as your audience builds. Um, but it's not, it's not a light switch. Like you don't put up a Patreon page and suddenly start making, you know, a thousand dollars per thing that you make. Um, I think a lot of people have the same frustrations with Kickstarter. They see someone go on Kickstarter. I know when my girlfriend ran her Kickstarter campaign a couple of years ago, she made over a hundred thousand dollars for her, uh, for her album that she was releasing. And some of these comments that were on her Kickstarter page were just so funny because people clearly didn't understand that she had an audience and, and this is why she was making money because she has people who really like what she makes. And people would say, how come you have $100,000 in Kickstarter? And I, I ran a project for my album and I only got $3,000, you know? And, and again, it just comes down to the fact that, you know, uh, if you have an audience and if you have a community who rallies around your work, um, that that's the most important thing. Can you tell us a story of someone who has joined Patreon and uh, how their story has perhaps inspired you and excited you? Yes, um, Scott Bradley, I think, is such an incredible. Oh, there's there's actually so many. Can I tell you two, or do I have to pick one? <laughs> you can tell us two, of course. <laughs> okay, um, Scott Bradley uh, is a wonderful creator. He makes these incredible. Um, videos, cover songs, yeah, okay, you've got them up on the screen here. They're like ju uh, jukebox covers of of pop songs. So he plays like ragtime piano and then there's singers and um, it's just, it's incredible stuff. So yeah, there's there's one of his, uh, one of his covers there. And uh, he, part of one of his goals was, uh, he said once he gets to $3,000 per video, he's gonna start uploading a video every week instead of every two weeks. Um, you can see the goals on the left side of the page there. Um, and he's just reached all these goals. Initially, his goal was $50 per video, right? Um, <laughs> and then I think $100 per video, et cetera. And he just blew by all these goals as his fans became patrons. Um, and now he's at the point where, you know, he's making, he's making a, you know, serious income on Patreon. He's going on tour, right? He's releasing a new video every week. Um, so he's been he's been able to grow his media company. You know, if you think about a creator as an entrepreneur, or um, you know, or, or as a uh, as, as a media company, he's been able to grow his business using the extra revenue from Patreon, and that to me is like the most exciting thing, right? If we can help a creator grow their business and become something that they didn't expect and that their audience didn't expect before, um, that's just the best thing in the world for us. Um, another creator I'm super excited about is Molly Lewis. Um, she has a, just a wonderful community around her work. She writes these really funny songs with clever lyrics. Um, her most recent one is hilarious. It's about beards. I love um, Molly Lewis. She's, yeah. she's, she's great. She is fantastic. And she's a perfect example of, um, often people will ask us, they'll say, hey, I have, uh, you know, 50,000 subscribers. Um, how many of my subscribers will be patrons? What's your conversion rate? And we always kind of say, hey, that depends on you. That depends not only on how hard you push it, but it depends on how much you love your community and how much your community loves you. You know, and, and Molly is a great example of someone with a really strong community of people who really care about her work. Um, I think on YouTube, she has, you know, 32,000 subscribers. Um, the beard video, you know, has 15,000 views on YouTube and it generated over $2,000 of income for her. Um, so that's a great example, again, of someone who just has, it's not that she has astronomical numbers and she's got millions of followers and, you know, she doesn't. She has a, she has a community that cares and that's, that's the most important thing. 
Jack, I have to ask, I mean, not only are you running this company and you mentioned that you're in funding mode, uh, which, yeah. uh, you know, as an entrepreneur, I know that that can be stressful, but you're also half of Pomble Moose. You guys were actually at the Twit Studio recently, um, hanging out with Leo Laporte. How do you juggle running a business that you're obviously so passionate about and also being an artist? Yeah, that's really hard. And that's actually, I just had a 20 minute conversation with uh, one of our potential investors about exactly that issue. Um, so one thing that founders struggle with, a lot of founders um, you know, build companies out of need, right? It's, I need this product and it doesn't exist and so I'm gonna make a company. And then they get themselves into a situation where they've got a company and they've got, they wanna do the, the thing that caused them to build the company at the same time. Um, so I guess it, it's working right now because I am tired <laughs> and <laughs> I don't sleep as much as I should and I don't exercise and, um, I don't know how healthy it is, but, um, I also don't take any days off. So, you know, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I'm in the studio cranking and working on Pomplamoos videos and, you know, we have deadlines and, um, we make our videos in, you know, three to four days max. Um, and we, we, you know, work on a song and we, you know, just, just, uh, two days ago, we recorded a new Pompamoose song and we had 15 hours to record the song start to finish. And we took 15 hours and at the end of 15 hours, we're done with our song and that's what we're going to post. And it's going to be a rough mix and that's okay. And, uh, you know, I, I have to kind of ditch some of my perfectionism to, to do that. Um, cause I think I have a tendency to want things to be really polished and glassy and, um, you know, I'm, I'm favoring just making making something good and and uh and quick not not in a bad way that sounds like i'm favoring bulk over quality and and i don't think we are i don't think we're compromising quality i just think deadlines help us uh focus our creativity but yeah it, it is a challenge it's one of the biggest challenges is juggling the time being a creator and you know and running patreon at the same time so we won't keep you for too much longer, but I just have one last question, which sure. is, uh, what's the future of Patreon? What, is, what are your hopes and uh, expectations for the company? Yeah, so um, I have one goal for Patreon, and it, it's, our, it's our mission, and it's the, it's the thing that we care most about. And it's actually strange that it's our mission, because I don't really consider myself to be a money-focused person. I have never have been. In fact, at one point in my life, I did a study, just, just for the fun of it, of how much money I had. Because as an artist, I sometimes I'm making a lot of money and sometimes I'm not making very much money at all. And I just tried to equate my happiness level with how much money I had. And I actually found that they were uh, proportional, but, but inversely proportional. So the more money I had, the less happy I was. Um, but, but that said, uh, so I'm, I'm not a very money-focused person. Yet with Patreon, the goal of Patreon, the mission of Patreon, is to send creators as much money as we possibly can. Um, and pretty much every decision that we make and, and everything that we do um, goes back to that goal. I, you know, um, we take a 5% cut, uh, Patreon does as a business. Um, that prevented us from getting funding from certain venture capitalists. They said, can you increase it to 15? And we said, no, we can't increase it to 15. We want to send as much as we can to artists. Um, and, uh, and some people are actually really on board with that. Some VCs are really on board with that. Um, some are not, but um, we learned that quickly. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the, goal, the goal is to send people money. And that means building out products that, are, that, that make conversion flows really easy. It means building out a creation page, live launch tools where a creator can you know, launch a piece of content and, and get new patrons. And um, uh, it means really great CRM so creators can make their patrons happy and make them feel good about continuing to donate. It means making the relationship between creators and patrons scalable and making it important and making it matter and making creators feel close to their communities and making communities feel close to the creators. Um, but again, it, you know, the problem here that we're solving is that my ad revenue check for, for my catalog of videos last month that got a million views, right? P Pompa Moose gets between one and four million views a month. My catalog personally gets around one million views a month and my check was $249 from AdSense for that million views. Wow. Um, that's, wow. Not, that's not okay. No, uh, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's certainly, well, it's not, it's, it's not like that can be your, you know, your, your primary job. 
it's not a, yeah it, it's it can't right so so I'm I do other things right I sell iTunes I do brand integration deals I'm hustling right as an artist I'm hustling to make a living um, and it's hard work creators are are incredible people I have so much respect for what they do and and um, and it, it, they they inspire me and and so I, I want to help them do what they're doing and that means right now their problem the, the problem for creators is getting paid there are a lot of tech companies there are a lot of services that will help you engage your audience you know reach your fans engage your I don't need that as a creator I don't need to engage I have these great tools that already exist to engage my what I need is a paycheck at the end of the month so that I can keep making videos that's what I need and that's what patreon is solving um, so more products that help that that's what you can expect uh, from from patreon's future jack conti co-founder of patreon and you said ceo or coo as well uh ceo ceo yeah. all right yeah. uh and obviously a very enthusiastic person in general uh music maker i i mean the list goes on really uh thank you so much for joining us um really kind of inspiring 15 minutes or so uh to be able to talk to you amber and i really appreciate it and um Really, best of luck with that funding round. I hope you get all the money in the world so that Patreon can only yes. grow and get more artists. Because there, there really are it's such such a great showcase of talented people, um, even, even for somebody who's never heard of Patreon before. Um, great discovery there, too. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. It really is uh, nice to so talk to you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Jack. And Take good care. luck. Thanks. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Uh, Amber, that was so fun. Yeah, I loved, he's so I loved him. <laughs> He's so inspiring. I'm just like, Sarah, let's go to Patreon now. <laughs> I know. We'll have to, well, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll figure out something that, you know, is, it, it'll be like a side project, not in the tech space. And, you know, we'll try to use our followings to, I don't know. I'm like, I don't people really will, have any other interests. People will interests. yell at us on Twitter. <laughs> exactly. Stop trying to talk about politics. Yeah. Just talk about tech. That's what you're here for. <laughs> I love those tweets. Right. Those are my favorite. Exactly. Like, you're not supposed to like other things. Nobody wants to hear about your sports tweets, Sarah. Uh, Why are you, you know, watching I'm, the news? <laughs> right, right. I, um, I'm so glad that Jack was able to join us um, because uh, Pomple Moose did come up to the Twit Studio a couple of weekends ago, and um, uh, they were part of an episode of Triangulation. I think it was two weekends ago. Somebody correct me if I'm wrong. Um, and I was bummed because it was over the weekend, and I wasn't up here, and I really like them, and I kind of wanted to be a fangirl, so, um, so that was such a treat. And if anybody has feedback, oh, there they are. Yeah, there we go. If anybody has feedback for us about uh, guests that you would like Amber and I to book for future episodes of the show, or just ideas in general, maybe you want to float a service by us, you think that we should cover, uh, the social hour at twit.tv is how you email us. Or you could leave us a voicemail. You could even run while you're leaving the voicemail. That's cool, <laughs> as long as you have something good to say. 2626-SOCIAL is the number, 2626-S-O-C-I-A-L. Or record a video or tweet at at me, at Sarah Lane, or at Amber Mack uh, throughout the week. Um, we are always connected to our social spaces. All right, Amber, well, before we wrap up this edition of the Social Hour, we've got a radder fad. Yes, okay, so uh, this one is kind of interesting. I saw quite a few people tweet about this, also post on Facebook about this. We've talked before in Radar Fad about 3D printing and the evolution of 3D printing, how it's gonna change many industries, including the healthcare industry. But this one is a little different. This is a product called the Mink that uh, uh, was unveiled recently. Uh, there's a, a video on TechCrunch at TechCrunch Disrupt where uh, the founder talks about Mink and uh, it's basically a 3D printer to allow you to create custom makeup at home. So instead of having to go out and buy a certain shade of makeup, as she describes in the demo, what you would do is if you were browsing online on YouTube and you saw someone doing a tutorial and showing different colors of makeup, you could easily uh, use something like Photoshop to find out the actual color code and then go in and use this little device, the Mink device, which I think is about $300. And you could custom create your own makeup from eyeshadow. This is what she's showing here as she uh, watches this video on YouTube. You could create eyeshadow, you could create lipstick, and uh, it would all be based on uh, what type of uh, colors that you found online, and of course, having this little device at home. I love it. I mean, I, I'd love to say, oh, I don't need makeup, but makeup is a big part of my life, um, and as long as I need it, the idea of getting makeup that is 
uh, I have complete control over the color, the palette, everything uh, for a much lower price and the convenience of being able to have materials um, and get something out of a 3D printer. And it's so cool that it's like, hey, you want a shadow or something that's a lip gloss or a blush? That's all pretty much the same base ingredients is very interesting to me. I don't really know that much about how, how cosmetics are manufactured. I just know that, you know, when you get something you like, sometimes you have to pay a pretty penny for it. And so having more control over this is rad. It is really rad. And if you get a chance to go check out our show notes and uh, watch the TechCrunch video, because she goes in to explain the cosmetics industry and how a big portion of that is really controlled by Walmart, for example. And she talks about the changes and trends and how there are always new colors of lipstick and eyeshadow, whatever it might be, and that this really empowers individuals to go and create their own products. And uh, it also allows you to get a sense, I think, of what is in the makeup that you're buying, which many of us don't really know, because uh, obviously there are only so many regulations that uh, uh, stop certain things from going into makeup, but I do like the idea of having more control over that process. So I think this is really rad. I think, uh, you know, the price point may be $300 or so, to, plus obviously what it costs for some of the materials, but that price point is bound to drop, assuming enough people enjoy this product and uh, it could be affordable for a lot of people compared to going out and buying new products all the time. Yeah. I mean, there are a variety of different, you know, different price points, but you know, something like this, which is just a makeup compact, depending on the brand, this could be like $50. Easily, it's yeah. It's crazy. Or it more. Is crazy. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. So I think I think uh, the 3D printing revolution, it's, it's so in its infancy right now, and we're still at the point where people are like, you could 3D print makeup, you could 3D print a boat, you could 3D print, a, you know, and, it's, and we all go, ooh, okay. Yeah. But as far as, what's really practical and, and the reasons that some of us will have 3D printers and it'll become an incorporated part of our life is this sort of stuff like this. Uh, mm -hmm. can, I, can I save money? Can I have a little bit more control over the type of products uh, that I need? I love it. And yeah, $300 yeah. investment uh, will pay itself back uh, quickly. Very quickly. And as you can see in the video, one of the things she shows us is just how it only prints a small amount, which I think makes a sense makes sense for a lot of different uh, types of makeup. You only need a little bit and then you can switch it up as time goes on. So a uh, big fan of this. I think she does a great job not only explaining it, but I do think uh, it will be a big hit. So uh, I think we agree, Sarah. I think we agree. It's rad. Two uh, thumbs up. Yeah, absolutely. We'll put the uh, link in our show notes as well. Um, but if you want to check it out, uh, get more information, gracemink.com. All right, Amber, we've come to the end of our hour, a very social hour indeed. Had a great guest, uh, quite, a, quite a few social-minded news items, uh, plus a few tips and a spotlight for all you guys. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, remember, we are uh, live on Thursdays regularly at 12 noon at Pacific time, 3 p.m. Eastern time. Amber, anything exciting going on in the next 10 days or so until I see you again? Uh, I don't think so. I have a really quick trip to Chicago next week, which is uh, one of my favorite cities. It's always fun to go there. I think I'm there for a whole 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And then other than that, just enjoying the patio weather here in Toronto, Sarah. And uh, I'm inspired after talking to our Patreon uh, co-founder. I don't know. Who knows? I may make more stuff. Who knows? We'll see. Yeah, it's true. I, I, I really do. You know, the the, uh, the night, night Attack folks um, who used to do NSFW here on Twit, also Patreon uh, users, and, and really have had a, uh, a, a very positive experience um, with the company. And, and yeah, just talking to Jack and, and, and seeing that, you know, of all, of all the questions that we ask, you know, they've, they, they, they've already asked themselves those questions, too. So it's kind of fun to get into the mind of, of a company that's relatively young and, and really out to help artists, which is not always uh, what you f find is the number one, you know, strategy in a, in a larger business. Um, and, and, yeah, it's just you, know, you, you can't help but root for them. Yeah, you can. I mean, and this is the the promise of the web and social in the early days, right? So we always believe people would use it for good. And every time you see an example on someone like him that talks about, okay, giving back to the artists and making sure they get the money that they deserve, I mean, it really renews my faith in the, the whole internet world. So it's, it's always a nice story. Love it. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for watching and listening to this episode of The Social Hour. Until next time, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Ever MacArthur, and we'll see you soon.